Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless isaiah 44 6 through 8 thus says the lord the king of israel and his redeemer the lord of hosts i am the first and i am the last besides me there is no god and who can proclaim as i do then let him declare it and set it in order for me since i appointed the ancient people and the things that are coming and shall come let them show these to them do not fear, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from that time and declared it? You are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? Indeed, there is no other rock. I know not one. In a conversation on religious questions, Frederick II, King of Prussia, asked Joachim von Zieten, General of the Hussars, whom he esteemed highly as a Christian, for his plain and uncompromised views. Give me proof for the truth of the Bible in two words, to which Zieten replied, your Majesty, the Jews. The general statement reflected his understanding of not only the miraculous preservation of the Jewish people, but his belief that their preservation was for the purpose of bringing God's unfulfilled promises to pass. To Zetan, the present existence of the Jewish people was proof that God's word was true, because Scripture had promised that they would remain until all that had been prophesied concerning them was fulfilled. Remarkably, this expression of faith was made in a day when the land of Israel was desolate of a Jewish population and the majority of Jews were scattered among the nations. We need no further proof than the Jewish nation of Israel to show that we are indeed in the last days prior to Jesus' return. Are we the final generation? There is one main event in Bible prophecy that had to happen to usher in the time that the Bible calls the last days and that event happened on May 14, 1948 just as the prophet Isaiah foretold. Isaiah 66 8 Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall the earth be made to give birth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion was in labor, she gave birth to her children. On the evening of May 14, 1948, at precisely 4 p.m., the members of the People's Council in Israel signed the proclamation and the declaration was made that the State of Israel is established. This meeting is adjourned. Israel not only became a nation, but also was literally brought forth as a nation in one day. Jesus talked about this fulfilled prophecy in Matthew 24, 32-35. Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near, at the doors. Assuredly I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Hosea 9:10. I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your fathers as the first fruits on the fig tree in its first season. Here God compares Israel to grapes and the fathers to fruits of the fig tree. Joel 1, 6 and 7 For a nation has come up against my land, strong and without number. His teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he has the fangs of a fierce lion. He has laid waste my vine and ruined my fig tree. He has stripped it bare and thrown it away. Its branches are made white. Joel speaks of my land as being comparable to my fig tree again showing that Israel ethnically, nationally, and geographically is symbolized as a fig tree. The generation spoken of here must be the generation that would see all the things that Jesus spoke of when the disciples questioned him about the signs of his coming and the end of the age. Specifically, it would be the generation that would see the fig tree budding. Since we know that the fig tree is Israel, then this generation must be the one that began at the commencement of the new state of Israel in 1948. Matthew 21:19. And seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it but leaves, and said to it, Let no fruit grow on you ever again. Immediately the fig tree withered away. We see Israel was a dried up fig tree for about 1900 years. And then miraculously the branch put forth leaves in one day on May 14, 1948. Jesus told us that when this happens his return is at the doors as we read in Matthew 24:33. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near, at the doors. Jesus went on to say that the generation that saw this would by no means pass away as we read in Matthew 24, 34. 
Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. On the Gregorian calendar, Sunday marked 75 years since David Ben-Gurion declared Israel a new nation. Israel celebrated back in April on the 25th and 26th. Yet in the middle of these celebrations, in the middle of the acknowledgement that a nation was born in a day, the U.N. is not celebrating this historic event. Instead, it's commemorating what Palestinians call the Nakba. That's Arabic for catastrophe. This twisting of history has the Israeli ambassador to the U.N. up in arms. Chris Mitchell explains why. Today, instead of observing the 75th anniversary of Israel, the U.N. is observing the anniversary of the Nakba, or catastrophe. The Nakba is what Palestinians say is their forcible eviction from the land of Palestine during Israel's War of Independence in 1948. The establishment of Israel. In 1947, the Palestine question came before the General Assembly of the United Nations. But the Arabs of Palestine cannot go into any political discussion on the basis of any Jewish state in Palestine. Surely the Jewish people is no less deserving than other peoples. Are the Arabs responsible for that problem? Have they acted or worked or helped in creating such a problem? The Jewish people were your allies in the war and joined their sacrifices to yours to achieve a common victory. The admission of the African is taken with the highest consummation of injustice. Argentina, Palestine, France, Yes. The resolution was adopted by 33 votes, 13 against, 10 abstentions. On May 14, 1948, the British government terminated its Palestine mandate, and on May 15, 1948, David Ben Gurion declared the independent state of Israel. Eastward, the Arab Legion poised for invasion on the Transjordan border. King Abdullah reviewed a brigade of reinforcements from Iraq. Immediately, a coalition of armies from Egypt, Syria, Jordan, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, and Lebanon invaded the new Jewish state. The war was marked by long periods of fighting and temporary ceasefires, with hostilities officially ending in January 1949. At that time, Israel held 5,600 square miles of territory allotted in the UN partition plan, plus an additional 2,500 square miles while Transjordan held the eastern sector of Jerusalem and the West Bank, and Egypt held the Gaza Strip. The Muslim states refused to negotiate peace or recognize Israel's right to exist, and remained in a state of war with Israel. Islam's Jewish problem reemerges. Muslims reacted to the Jewish victory with shock. It caused a theological challenge of the greatest scope imaginable. Islamic-Jewish military conflict had now reoccurred with opposite results. While the Muslims of the first Ummah in Medina had defeated the Jews, the Jews had now achieved political independence, overcome Muslims in battle, and ruled over Muslims in a land that was taken by Dar al-Islam at the outset of the great conquests. The Jews were known to be weak, cowardly, impure, and condemned by God to humiliation. Such people were not supposed to defeat them. 
a Jewish state was the ultimate insult and degradation, whereby protectors became tributaries, and tributaries became protectors. While Islam's initial victory over the Jews in the time of Muhammad was a sign of coming conquests and divine vindication, it was feared their defeat by the Jews might signal the final demise after a decline of 300 years. Hence, Muslims considered the founding of the State of Israel to be a Nakba, a catastrophe of historic proportions. Psalm 2, 1 through 12. Why did the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh, the Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, be wise, O kings, be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all those who put their trust in him. Israeli ambassador to the UN, Gilad Erdan, blasted the UN, which is the source of many anti-Israel resolutions. Instead of commemorating the real Nakba, the expulsion of almost a million Jews from Arab countries, following the establishment of Israel, this biased organization is distorting its own history. I'm working to ensure that member states understand that attending this despicable event means destroying any chance of peace by adopting the Palestinian narrative calling the establishment of the State of Israel a disaster while ignoring Palestinian hate, incitement, terror, and refusal to accept the legitimacy of a Jewish state. The anniversary comes just hours after a ceasefire ended a five-day conflict between Israel and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad. The terror group fired more than 1,400 rockets at southern Israel, landing as far away as Tel Aviv and on the outskirts of Jerusalem. Israel attacked hundreds of rocket launching sites, and the Iron Dome shot down about 90% of the rockets headed toward populated areas. A few did get through, as in the city of Ashkelon, and two died in separate rocket attacks. Many believe it's just a matter of time until another round of fighting will resume. And some expect it might come as early as Thursday, when Israelis will celebrate another anniversary, the reunification of the city of Jerusalem in 1967. Known as Jerusalem Day, it's marked by thousands of Israelis marching through the old city of Jerusalem, waving Israeli flags. Hamas has warned it will respond if the path of the march goes through the Muslim quarter. As a sign of his coming and the end of the age, Jesus declares, And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. The prophets of the Old Testament prophesied of these future military conflicts in Isaiah 17.1, in which Damascus, Syria will be destroyed in a single night. Jeremiah 49, the prophecy of Alam, which could infer an Israeli attack upon Iran's nuclear program. Psalm 83, in which the Muslim nations that border Israel will mount an attack on Israel in order to cut them off from being a nation. Ezekiel 38 and 39, known as the War of Gog and Magog. In this prophecy, a coalition of nations led by Russia, Iran, and Turkey will attack Israel in the last days in order to take Israel's wealth. In the last days, the prophet Zechariah prophesied Israel would have a powerful military. Zechariah 12:6. In that day I will make the governors of Judah like a fire pan in the woodpile, and like a fiery torch in the sheaves. They shall devour all the surrounding peoples on the right hand and on the left, but Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, Jerusalem. In the last days, the prophet Zechariah tells us Israel will be the focal point of world conflict, and he gives a dire warning to the nations who would dare come against Jerusalem. Zechariah 12, 2 and 3 Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples, when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces. 
though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. This prophecy is unfolding right before our very eyes. Despite today's controversy at the UN, Israeli commentator Gil Troy says the 75th anniversary marks a miraculous rebirth of the Jewish state after 2,000 years. If we think about the miracles of Israel, it's not just that Israel has survived despite so many enemies. It's not just that Israel has been a democracy. It's absorbed three million Jews from all over the world, white, black, religious, secular, doesn't matter. They're all welcome. It has created a startup nation which is generating all kinds of miracles for the 22nd century. So here we are, we look backwards and we're rooted in a story of thousands of years, but we look forward and we're inventing the future. That's a miracle every single day. Psalm 122.6, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Praying for the peace of Jerusalem means praying for Jesus' return as he is the only one who brings true peace when he returns as King of Kings and Lord of Lords at his second coming. The Bible says my king is the king of the Jews. He's a king of Israel. He's a king of righteousness. He's a king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's a king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I, I wonder do you know him. <laughs> my king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he purifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's a key to knowledge. He's a well-framed of wisdom. He's a doorway of deliverance. He's a pathway of peace. He's a roadway of righteousness. He's a highway of holiness. He's a gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. And his yoke is easy. And his burden is light. I wish I could describe him for you. He's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. Well, you can't get him out of your mind. You can't, you can't get him off of your head. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. Well, the Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Tyler couldn't find any fault in him. Terror couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him, and the grave couldn't hold him. Yeah! There is nothing more essential to the world than the gospel of Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4, Paul declares what the gospel is and how important it is to embrace it and share it with others. He reminds the Corinthians of the gospel he preached among them, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, that Christ is coming back for his church someday, in the rapture according to the scriptures, as we read in 1 Corinthians 15, 51-55. Behold, 
I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? Jesus promised his followers he was going to go and prepare a place for them in his Father's house, where there are many mansions, as we read in John 14, 1-3. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. This is the essence of the gospel, the pure gospel of Jesus Christ, his death on the cross for sinners, his resurrection to everlasting life, and his coming back someday is central to our Christian faith. 1 Corinthians 1.18 For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive in faith the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.